Church. Let's try and get going. So, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to my talk. Uh, my name is Matt Hale. I'm an assistant professor at TCU. And today, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about some of the research I've been doing with a bunch of different collaborators, um, including this project which I started working with Crystal Nichols at the end of my postdoc and kind of continued uh, working on that during my time at TCU. And so, what I want to talk about today is using RNA seq data to characterize gene expression in two different behavioral types or ecomorphs of brook trout and Lake Superior. Okay, and so my interest in behavior as a trait is really um, with respect to the genetic basis that underpins different sorts of behaviors. And over the past few decades, there's been a lot of absolutely fantastic work that has linked various and different behaviors to either alleles in individual genes or changes in gene expression. And I just want to highlight some good examples. So for example, the foraging behavior in Drosophila, some research has found that that is linked between different alleles in the, in, uh, the fore gene. Similarly, in, in the zebra finches, alleles in the FOXP2 gene have been found to be associated with the ability of male zebra finches to learn their song from their fathers. And as I said, it's not just alleles in the genome, but also amounts of gene expression that can differ between the development of different behaviors. And some good examples of that include territoriality behavior and the amount of good allotropin releasing hormone in mouth brood of cichlids. And in uh, salmon and trout, which is the system I work on, uh, the amount of pomp C, cortin, and the amount of expression of that gene can be found to be linked to different feeding behaviors in, uh, in rainbow trout. Okay. So the system I want to talk uh, to you guys about is brook trout's um, uh, populations from Lake Superior. And brook trout in Lake Superior exists as two different behaviors or two different ecomorphs. There's one which uh, migrates out to Lake Superior when the fish are about two years of age, feeding on resources in the lake before returning to their natural streams to spawn. And another resident form that stays in their freshwater tributaries that lead into Lake Superior throughout the whole course of their life. And so these uh, migratory forms, also often known as coastal brook trout, when you're familiar with that coastal brook trout, these beautiful fish that get these amazing colors, much more, much larger than the resident fish, and also much more fecund, which is one of the main reasons they migrate out into the lake, is to take advantage of those resources which aren't present in the streams, allowing the fish to come back and be much more fecund than those that stay in the stream. Okay, what do we know about these um, phenotypes? The first thing, the important thing, is that we know these are highly heritable. And what that suggests, of course, is underlying genetic effects with respect to the propensity to be migrant or resident. With that being said, a um, former colleague of mine at Purdue, actually Elias, did a GWAS looking at both coastal and resident brook trout, and she didn't find many alleles associated with that behavior. And those alleles she did find were a very, very small effect size. Now, linking this into behavior and the possibility of, of um, looking at gene expression to maybe answer this question, Several different behaviors have been studied in several different um, populations of brook trout in Lake Superior, and has found that both boldness and aggression are significantly associated with the propensity to be a migrant, to be a coastal brook trout. And what all this suggests in total is we know the behavior is highly heritable, this behavior is heritable. And also, this behavior is linked with, uh, with different behaviors are linked to that uh, migration phenotype. Okay. So that's linking to the study I'm involved in. So, um, Nicole Bushmeyer is a former MS student, and she measured three different behaviors and lots of different progeny of brook trout. She measured uh, time to exit an enclosure, so how long an individual fish spends in the enclosure before it moves out of the enclosure. This is kind of a measurement of um, boldness, exploration. She also measured general activity, which is just how much time an individual fish spends swimming around this enclosure. And lastly, um, the measurement of sociability, so how long the individual's fish spends in a mirror that Nicole put in uh, the aquarium where she was doing these studies. And the idea here being fish that spend a lot of time near the mirror are likely to be social, they're looking for conspecifics, they're wanting to show with other fish, versus those that show very little interest in the mirror, perhaps being a little more bold and more exploratory. Okay. So from the Nicole study, two important things. The first thing is that all three of these behaviors were highly heritable, which is great, again, suggesting underlying genetic effects. But she also found that these behaviors were highly repeatable. And what that means is she, Nicole conducted several different behavioral trials with these individual fish. And if she found, for example, that an individual fish would have a short time to exit its enclosure, 
that fish will keep having a short time to exit its enclosure despite many different um, trials. So these, these, these behaviors per fish were very repeatable, which is also good. Okay, so my components of the project on my side of the project have three main aims I want to talk to you about today. The first is just very broadly, are there differences in gene expression between fish that we're going to call shy fish and fish we're going to call bold fish? Secondly, if so, what are these genes doing? So what sort of pathways, what sort of biological functions are these genes involved in? And lastly, if I get time, I want to talk a little bit about some new data I've just run uh, last month that looks at polymorphisms within coding regions of these genes, and basically repeating the GWAS question from Ashley's study. We're going to say, are there alleles in these differentially expressed genes that are linked between uh, these different behaviors, i.e. shine bulk? Okay, so we use an RNA-seq approach, and we sampled a total of 64 fish that we did RNA-seq on. We sampled two different time points. The first here is about four to five months old, and we, these are going to be called the young of year, or the YOY, um, in the rest of the talk. So these are fish not long after the hatch. And then the second time point is uh, two years post the hatch, and that's around the time point where fish, if they're going to migrate out into the lake, are going to do it. So we've got two different time points, 64 fish in total. This is a terrible figure, but I'll walk you through it. So this is a principal component analysis of those three behaviors that Nicole measured. And so each of these individual points represents one of those individual fish. Blue dots are the young of year, and red dots are the um, second year fish. And here's how those three different components load onto that principal component analysis. So if we look at one of our measurements of behavior here, activity, Fish on the left, the top left quadrant, had a high amount of activities. So it spent a lot of time swimming um, in, in their behavioral experiment. On the other hand, individual fish down here were high in sociability, so they spent a lot of time at the mirror, didn't spend a lot of time away from the mirror. And this is an inverse relationship here of exit. So the fish up here had a fast time to exit, and individual fish down here had a slow time to exit. So using these three uh, behaviors, we grouped uh, fish into being shy and bold. And so individual fish at the top left quadrant here we call the bold fish, high activity, quick time to exit and low sociability, versus fish down here in the bottom right quadrant we call shy, spent a lot of time in the mirror, slow time to exit, and didn't spend a lot of time swimming around their enclosure. So those are two groups for our um, RNA seq analysis. And that's where we sampled uh, 64 fish in these two. Okay, so I'm going to pan through this slide because there's a lot of information here, a lot of text. So for RNA seq and bioinformatics, um, we used whole grain, so we uh, um, euthanized the fish and took the entire grain out, extracted the RNA and sent that off for a little bit of sequencing. We used RSCM and Edge R to both align uh, these reads back to our de novo assembly and uh, to determine gene expression respectively. We then used um, Ingenuity Pathway Analysis, or IPA, which is software provided by Kyogen, in order to try and find out if any pathways were enriched for differentially expressed genes and what those pathways were. When it came to the GWAS, although uh, working on salmon and trout is great, I can't really keep saying they're normal or species since we have two fully sequenced and fully annotated genomes, there is no such information for brook trout. So what I used was a related species, the Arctic char, to map the RNA seq reads in order to try and figure out if any polymorphisms are in these sequences and where they are with respect to patterns of gene expression. And I used STAR for that analysis. Any candidate SNPs were required to have a minor allele frequency of greater than 5%, and three gene types in at least 95% of those 64 fish. Okay, and so I did the GWAS in plain, I used sex, so I didn't mention this, sorry. Uh, we also have sex information, so we know the whether or not these fish are male or female, which is important, because females get a greater amount of return by migrating than males due to um, the resource acquisition associated with being not going to be higher. So we included sex in that model. And any SNPs that were associated with this behavior were able to map back, map back to the Arctic chart genome to determine are these in exons, are these non synonymous or synonymous substitutions, are they in promoter regions, and so on and so forth. Okay, so let's jump right into some data. So, uh, differentially expressed genes, we've got two different contrasts per time point. We've got males, females, males, females. Oops, where's my key? There we go. 
And so this is just a total number of differentially expressed genes. As you can see in three of our four contrasts, it's roughly even amounts of upregulated genes between the shy and bold. The only difference is really is in the female from the second year time point, where we see many more genes upregulated in the bold fish compared to the shy fish. Now, with respect to what these genes are doing, one of the things we noticed immediately was that there are a few genes shared between contrasts. In other words, if the gene was differentially expressed in, let's say, the males from the younger year, very few of those genes were also differentially expressed either in the females at the same time point or either of the other two <coughs> times and data sets from the second year. However, one gene was consistently upregulated, and this was upregulated in bold fish and all four of our contrasts, and it's involved in glucose metabolism. Okay. So one of the things about RBC data, it does not surprise me that you get this kind of choppy patterns of gene expression, especially when you're dealing with something complicated like the brain, and especially when you're dealing with these early developmental time points. Right? These patterns of gene expression are very temporally variable. And so pathways are great. And looking at how these genes associate with individual pathways is a great idea, trying to get a kind of bigger umbrella picture about what might be going on in the brain. Okay. So a large number of pathways were found to be enriched for differentially expressed genes, 265 for a year samples and 303 for our um, second year samples. Now when we, look, when we look at the function of these pathways, they're involved in lots of different things, including metabolism, neurogenesis, OXMOS pathways, and cell signaling. Again, most of them, if you think about what's going on in the brain at these early life stages, that's perhaps not surprising, right? Lots of changes happening um, in the brain tissue. Now, some things of interest though. We did find dopamine feedback signaling pathway being enriched for differentially expressed genes in all contrasts. And why is that interesting? Because several different studies, oh, you're kidding, okay. Several different studies, <laughs> and in a large number of different species, have found dopamine genes to be associated with the development of different behaviors. So that's potentially super interesting. In addition, circadian rhythm pathways were enriched for differentially expressed genes in both younger gear contrasts as well as one of our second year contrasts. And if we zoom into circadian rhythm genes that were found to be differentially expressed at least one time point, or excuse me, one, one data set, we have both cry one and cry two, these are two cryptochrome genes, both were upregulated in bold fish, and then clock, which is upregulated in shy fish, and that's interesting because other studies in, the, in Chinook salmon have found clock to be important with respect to long time with migration. And so these genes here, these differentially expressed genes, at least one contrast and circadian rhythm pathways could be interesting for further research and perhaps we've got a mechanism there. All right, so I'm going to try and pair through this GWAS analysis. There's a GWAS. <laughs> right, so we've got a Manhattan plot. You've got the individual chromosomes and rotating colors. Here's our bond friendly line of significance. And what you can see is two different areas where we find significantly associated SNPs with those behaviors, one on chromosome 30 and one on chromosome 21. Now, let's zoom into these two peaks. Chromosome 13, here's our gene, back in one. This is a SNP in the last exon. It's a synonymous SNP, so it's not a non-synonymous SNP, so it's not changing the amino acid. It's involved in autophagy and apoptosis. Unfortunately, the bigger peak on chromosome 21, the underlying there is uncharacterized protein, although that protein does have an amino globulin in the main, so it could have something to do with immunity, but we're not really certain. Okay, so let's wrap this up. We find a whole bunch of genes differentially expressed in the brain to associate with this behavior. We find a few different pathways of interest which might be warrant further investigation. And we find GWAS, which again is key, as many different of these sort of um, studies find, many alleles of very, very small effects. And not getting those really those and then having lots instead seeing very few alleles of small effects. Okay, I'm out of time, so I just want to thank um, people who helped with this with sequencing and some questions at TCU. And of course, the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission for finding the funding. Thank you for your attention, folks.